We've, we've built today's program so that there are lots of little breaks and sort of talking heads. This was just one of them. We've also created a whole series of things that we call narrative interludes. And these are interludes where we wanted to invite people that have been telling stories about the food system to join us here on stage and tell a story. Now, not these stories are not all happy stories. In fact, many of them are quite challenging. But the point of them is to put the work that we do grounded in the, in the reality of the food system challenges that we're around without us having to sort of engage in sort of Q&A and tearing it all apart, to accept it as a story in and of itself. So this is our lunchtime story. Um, and uh, at this point, I want to invite Barry Estabrook, the author, author of Tomato Land Up, to share a little narrative or interlude about the tomato. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a total gastronomic loss. Uh, with those four words, James Beard in 1974 summed up the condition of the supermarket mass produce tomato. He did it in four words. Um, I wrote a whole book about it, but uh, <laughs> to come to the same conclusion. But uh, I have to say that the tomatoes deserved it. Um, they came at me first. Um, I, uh, I was uh, driving along I-75 a few years ago in southwestern Florida and came up behind, um, I thought it was a gravel truck at first, one of those open back trucks. But as I grew closer, I realized it wasn't gravel on top. At first thing, it was green and I thought, well, spheres. And I thought, they're Granny Smith apples until I realized that apples don't grow in Florida. Um, and as I came up right behind the truck, I saw it was loaded, you know, overflowing, piled high with what you see this gentleman picking here, bright green tomatoes, which is the way Florida tomatoes are picked. They're totally green. They're gassed to turn them red. And I was, I was sitting there watching this, and we, hit a, we came into a construction zone. The truck hit a big bump of some sort, and three or four of these tomatoes came flying off um, toward my windshield. And, and uh, you know, I, I sort of veered and, and pulled back in, 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 the, in lane, and they, they missed. But they hit the pavement of the interstate highway. And they bounced. <laughs> and they rolled into the ditch where they joined dozens of other identical tomatoes, all of which, you know, had, had fallen off trucks. And I, I thought, how do you get from a garden tomato? I grow brandy wines in my garden. And, you know, I pick them, and I consider myself lucky to get them the 25 yards to the kitchen counter w without having them split or, or leak or something like that. How do you get from that, that wonderful fruit, to things that can fall off a truck from 10 feet, hit an interstate highway at 70 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour, and survive? Um, how did we get there? Um, this, I mean, this audience does not eat very many industrial-produced tomatoes. So you know, what, what, is, what does this mean to you and, uh, and me? And what it, what it means is that the more I started to look into modern tomato production, commercial tomato production, the more I realized that the tomato is, is a poster child for so much of what's wrong with the way we produce food today, the whole food system. Um, you know, you, you think of things, words like being bantied around here a few minutes ago, sustainable, local, um, fresh, fair trade, organic. The tomato, the modern tomato, violates every one of them. The vi it shows you that when you strip all of these things away, these, these words do mean something. Where, you know, sometimes you forget that. They do mean something. And when you strip them away, you end up with these hard, tasteless spheres. Um, so this talk has two parts to it. 
In the beginning, I'm going to sort of give you the, the problems. <laughs> but I want you to keep in mind that the modern tomato also has given us a way out of, of some of the most serious problems. Um, and that's what the second half, second, the end of the talk will focus on. Um, so let's just talk about taste. What happened to the taste? And it, you know, really it has everything to do with money. Um, well, since 1970s, a tomato, an acre of commercial tomatoes now yields three times what it did in the 1970s. Three times as much fruit, three times as much poundage. Um, and that's because commercial plant breeders have focused almost exclusively on yield, getting pounds of tomatoes out of the soil. A, a farmer in Florida told me quite candidly, he said, Barry, I don't get paid a cent for flavor. I get paid by the pound. And it's true. Uh, he also said, and, and the, the, the woman in the supermarket, she doesn't taste my tomatoes before she buys them. Sadly, true. So what has happened is taste has gotten lost. Taste is a very expensive, difficult thing to breed for in a tomato. It's very complex. And it's gotten lost, because no one's paying for it um, in, in commercial tomatoes. Um, Along the way, and the situation is more than skin deep, um, the modern tomato, the modern supermarket tomato, has a third left, less vitamin C in it than a tomato in the 1960s. It's got way less niacin. You go down the list of nutrients that you expect in a tomato, and the modern tomato is deficient in every way except one. It has 14 times as much sodium as a tomato during the Kennedy era. The good news, I guess, is that researchers are trying to breed taste back into the industrial tomato. There's a couple of groups at the University of Florida who, one of them is literally working molecule by molecule using conventional breeding, not GMO, to get taste back in the tomato. And it could happen that in 10 years we'll have a tomato that can hit I-75 and bounce, but still taste like something for what that's, <laughs> that's worth. But there's a lot of other problems. Um, yeah. The first problem is that you would have to be, from a botanical point of view, from a horticultural point of view, you would have to be an idiot to try to grow a commercial crop of tomatoes in a place like Florida. It sounds counterintuitive. Um, but it's true. There's, there's two big problems. Um, the first big problem is that Florida is incredibly humid. It's, it's humid year-round. And tomatoes' wild ancestors are, are native to the western coasts of South America, um, some of the driest desert areas in the world. Um, and tomatoes hate humidity. Um, that's why they do well in Italy hot, dry, you know, rainless summers. That's why they do well in California. Um, but they hate humidity. And everything that would destroy a tomato plant, all the funguses, molds, rusts, insects, wilts, loves humidity. So you're growing these plants in a place where they don't, they simply don't belong. Um, the, the only thing Florida has going for is that it's warm enough to grow tomatoes at a time of year when people in New York and Chicago and Boston, um, nearby, you know, for a truck to get to, are, are hungry for tomatoes or will buy them. It's the only reason. Um, the other problem is um, soil. And with all due respect to the dirty carrot group, there is no dirt on these tomatoes. Um, <laughs> Florida tomatoes are either grown in gravel, a coral gravel, south of Miami, there's a region where, and it looks just like white gravel, or in most of the state, sand. And the sand, it's not sandy loam or sandy soil, it's sand. The same stuff you get on Daytona Beach, and it's no more nutritious for a plant. Um, so you've got humidity and bad soil. Um, the bad soil is easy to take care of from a, a factory farming point of view. 
They just pump the sand full of uh, all the necessary artificial fertilizers that the plant will need and seal it up with plastic and, and away it goes. It may as well be hydroponic growing. Humidity is a different, a different issue. And to grow tomatoes in the Florida's climate, the farmers have to, well, it's, it's, it's chemical warfare, except without the Hague conventions. Um, you know, forget Hague. They can, they, the official Florida government handbook on tomato farming lists um, over 100 different pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides that a farmer can put on his tomatoes during the course of a year. The plants are sprayed often twice a week. Um, just, just to keep um, the pests that would destroy them at bay. Um, an example, California and Florida produce roughly the same amount of uh, fresh tomatoes on the same acreage. Florida farmers use eight times as much pesticide, fungicide, and herbicide. It costs them $2,000 an acre to put these chemicals on their tomatoes. The USDA finds that about half the tomatoes in supermarkets still have these chemicals on them. Um, they assure us that they're not there in quantities that will do us any harm, um, uh, if you are comforted by that. Um, but there's one, one group that, that is harmed, there's no doubt about that, and that's the workers. Um, I probably talked to three or four dozen during the research of the book, and I'd ask them the question, I'd say, hey, have you ever been uh, like sprayed with pesticide? And they would look at me and, and as if it were the stupidest question they'd ever heard, and they'd say, of course, man, all the time. Sprayed until your clothes were wet? Yeah, yeah, they don't care. Um, if you can't run out of the way, you get sprayed. All of them. There's actually been studies that show that 97% say they've been sprayed. It's illegal, of course, but doesn't seem to matter. What's this resulted in? Well, there's a whole set of diseases now that, that modern medicine is calling agricultural cancers. Um, there are some horrific stories um, out of Florida of, of babies born with, with birth defects whose mothers had been sprayed throughout their gestation period. Um, And there is, in addition to being sprayed, there's another problem the workers face. As you see, unlike canning tomatoes, fresh market tomatoes have to be picked by hand. They haven't invented a machine that will do it economically. Um, so you have to find somebody to do that. Coincidentally, um, labor is the only area it, cost area that a Florida farmer really has control over. He, he can't control what Monsanto charges, he can't control what the oil company charges, he can't control what Walmart will pay him, but he can control what he pays the guy that picks the tomatoes. So um, what's happened is the wages stayed the same since 1980, the same. Um, it's created, where this got us is probably the worst job in the United States, all things considered. Um, you know, at the bottom, there's abject slavery. Seven cases in the last 15 years in Florida. We're talking people chained up at night so they don't run away, people being bought and sold, people being beaten for not working hard enough. Um, no pay, of course. Um, seven cases freeing over 1,200 people. The tip of a very ugly iceberg. <laughs> the very best tomato worker, um, the very top tomato worker, is lucky to make minimum wage. Um, he's, he's virtually exempt, he is exempt from most of the labor protections that, that other American workers got in the 1930s. Receives no benefits, no vacation pay, is entitled to no overtime, no limit on the amount of time in the day that he or she can work. Um, has no guarantee of work, but still has to be available. Um, you know, if it rains, too bad. You're out of, uh, uh, if the dew is too heavy, you sit and wait. You're not paid. If there's a freeze, which there often is, you could be out of work for a month. Um, children of 12 years of age can do work in, in the fields that you have to be 16 years old to do in any other profession. So 
that's where this talk would have ended had I given it a year ago on that sort of grim note that this is where these tasteless orbs have gotten to us. Except in the last year, there's been an enormous sea change in Florida tomato production. Um, it happened suddenly. It shocked everybody, even those most closely involved. Um, it was when the Florida Tomato Growers Exchange, which represents all the major growers in Florida, and these are huge industrial companies. Um, you know, there's only 12 farms that grow most of the tomatoes in Florida, um, have sales of $50 million each. Um, but these farmers, last November, agreed to pay their the workers one penny more a pound. Um, doesn't sound like much, but they currently make a penny and a half. So it's a huge raise. It's the difference between $50 a day and $80 a day. Um, they set up a grievance procedure, a, a, a formal grievance procedure, so that if a worker sees somebody who might be enslaved, there's a way to report that. Before there was, there was no way. There, there was, there was a, you know, a, a firewall between the workers and the people that own the companies. Um, there, there's now um, first aid and health worker, every work crew of about 50 people has two or three people who are trained in health and first aid so they can recognize pest signs of pesticide poisoning. Um, shade, they now have little, those little pop-up tents like you see in the farmer's markets in the, in the fields so that the workers can get a bit of shade during lunch. I went to one large packing plant this spring on, which was working under the new rules and there was a brand new little building um, roofed over area and had solar panels on the top of it and inside was something totally unheard of until recently in the Florida tomato field and called a punch clock so that the workers could actually punch in and get credited really for the time they worked. Um, this overnight sensation of course um, took 20 years of hard hard work <laughs> by a uh, a ragged, an organization called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Immokalee is a, um, a small city in southwestern Florida, sort of the, the largest migrant worker city in the state. Um, started out as a ragtag group that would meet in church basements. Their early efforts seemed to be rounding up 10 or 12 guys to go over to a crew boss's house. Who, who maybe was trying not to pay one of them, and so 10 of them would ask politely if he would mind writing a check. Um, and, but it got more and more sophisticated over time, and at one point they realized there's no point in arguing with the farmers. They have nothing to lose. Why don't we go to the end users? And so they said, okay, well, let's try that. We'll try, we'll try one called Taco Bell. It had that annoying chihuahua Remember, Gidget was her name, uh, with, with a Mexican accent that really offended people. Um, and so they said, we'll take on Taco Bell. And for four years they did. They demonstrated. They had hunger strikes. They, they, they used new media, these, these, this, these sort of field workers. They, they quickly grasped that there was something to the internet. And they used new media and their own website to gather support from university students all across the country. 20 universities kicked Taco Bell off their campus because the students said, we don't want some, you know, this outfit on there if it doesn't pay workers, 20. And that's money. And that caught the attention of the executives. So after four years, Taco Bell said, OK, enough. And they came aboard agreeing to the penny a pound and those grievance procedures and things that I talked about. And it went right down the line. As soon as Taco Bell came, they started at McDonald's. It eventually caved in. Along the way, the, f the um, food service companies um, joined the campaign. Um, Sodesco, you know, Sodesco, who's going to be feeding us later, was one of them. Um, and you know, pretty soon they had they had um, all of the all the major fast food joints and all of the major food service companies aboard, pushing for this. And it was really only a matter of time before one of the big tomato growers caved, which happened earlier last fall. And then, of course, the others couldn't, you know, fell all over themselves. Of course, you know. Um,
there's still work to be done. I mean, not a single supermarket chain, without, with the exception of you know Whole Foods. Um, I have problems with Whole Foods too, but it's true they're the only um, supermarket chain that has come aboard. The others have refused. So half the tomatoes are still picked the old way, for you know without the penny a pound and without the protections. But the template is there. It, it, what they've done successfully, this ragtag group, is link the chairman and executives of billion dollar food companies, McDonald's, Burger King, with the presidents of multi-million dollar agribusinesses, the growers of tomatoes, with the very lowest worker in the fields, the below the minimum wage picker. They're now linked. There used to be firewalls between them, but they're now all in the same conversation. And like I said before, it's, it, it's a template that I think other agricultural workers can use. So I think James Beard, if he were around, would, would still have to say that the industrial tomato is a total gastronomic loss. Uh, but there is the consolation that, you know, during a period in our country's history when labor is, is, fighting, a, a, is fighting and losing a rearguard action, um, that a really interesting blow for food justice um, has, has taken root in, in the inhospitable tomato fields of Florida. Thank you.